How's everybody doing? It is great to be back at BrewCon after 10 years. So last time I was here was 10 years ago. I mean, we lost a few years to, to COVID, obviously, but 10 years went really fast. It felt like I was just in Ghent yesterday. Um, and in the past, I've, I've spoken a lot about Mauer, uh, if anybody read about my bio or, or the Mauer book, which I'll mention today often always talking about malware and reverse engineering, and that's what I always spoke about at BrewCon when I came. Uh, but today I'm going to cover something that I think has taken me a lot further, and I think will take everybody in the room a lot further, and it's more focused on education. Uh, of course, malware is going to be very much intertwined with that, um, but it's sort of like this idea of like reverse engineering in IDA uh, was like all I did in the beginning of my career. And then sort of as I started learning about teaching and sharing knowledge with people in many different facets, it's uh, really, really changed the game. Uh, and then at the end, I think we're going to turn it to sort of an Ask Me Anything Q&A session. Um, and I think those of you in the other room, hopefully you see me on the stream and we'll be able to ask questions as well. And uh, yeah, it's a true honor to, to be here, excited to be in front of you all. And uh, you know, loving the beer theme, of course, so my first slide has to be beer. Uh, and actually, when I, my first BrewCon was not, last time I was here was 10 years ago, but my first BrewCon was actually 12 years ago uh, in 2012. Uh, and at that time, I you know, came in and was like, all right, we've got to find what is known as like the best beer in the world, right? West Vlederen. Uh, and if you're not familiar, it's like reverse engineering level of, you know, to figure out how to acquire this beer. You have to like call in advance, negotiate these monks who like, if you don't follow the rules perfectly, they just, they, they throw you out and then they put these crates of beer in the back of your car. So I ended up renting a car on my first trip here and driving out to this middle of nowhere uh, monastery where to, to acquire this beer, which has no labels on it or anything. Uh, and I, yes, I brought an entire suitcase and wrapped this all up and brought it back to New York City. Uh, in, in, you know, packaged, not a single bottle broke. And uh, I still have the crate to this day in my, in my apartment, and I have probably, probably about 10 bottles left that have been aging for 12 years now. And you can, uh, yeah, this is like a very special beer that you can age like wine, um, and you could have it like 25 years. So my idea, like, you know, when I first started coming here, I didn't have any children. And now it's like, as they get older, I'm like, they might actually get one of these beers that is older than they are. Um, so that'll be really fun when that day comes. But it's collecting dust, and I'll make, I drink one every Christmas with my, my father and my brother. So shifting back to education and, and sort of the theme is like, I think about BrewCon, and the, work, the workshop aspect I think is really special because you're able to get that education. Yeah, they have the trainings as well, of course, and I, I, I taught a malware class in the trainings, but I thought the workshops were the most fun because they were very condensed, and you're learning about a topic really, really quickly. Uh, and I think that, you know, I came to BrewCon, you know, hacking for beer, get the West Letter in, that was kind of like the, what, what brought me over first, but then I came three years in a row because of how much I love the experience of like coming into the classroom, didn't really know what was, what was going to happen, if there was going to be like, you know, beer in the room during the workshop or what was going to happen. And uh, these were the, the talks. I actually found the, the old abstracts from like 12 years ago. One was on, uh, they were both on machine learning. Uh, so I was, we were doing AI stuff well before it was cool. And everybody was talking about AI, right? That's all everybody talks about anymore. Uh, and the first one was focused on you take a piece, a binary, and you figure out if it's good or bad, and you build your own model. Uh, and so you learned about malware analysis and how to, do, how to build a model very quickly. Uh, and little did we know, that's exactly what, if you remember the endpoint product silence, they ended up taking that and just putting it on an endpoint. And it was like, you know, billion dollar idea or whatever it was. So there was billion dollar ideas that you could have expanded on very easily at a BrewCon workshop, right? Uh, and there's our the original UI for it that was presented 12 years ago. It's like a, a button to, to scan files and determine what's good or bad. Uh, and then we also did another talk that was on like clustering malware and how to, how to do that using ML. So it was just really this pure, fun 
knowledge sharing experience that I think you get at BrewCon that makes it really special. And then to see the expansion in a venue like this, is, it's, it's really remarkable. I was like walking in today, I was like, whoa, all right, this has uh, come a long ways in the, in the 12 years. Uh, keeping going forward on sort of my education journey, uh, one place where I ended up teaching many years in a row was at Black Hat, focused on teaching these reverse engineering classes. And it was always these experienced professionals who would show up to the room. And I think it gave a really good insight into, you know, they're keeping it on your toes because some of them have actually been doing something professionally longer than what you're teaching them. And they would always give their views of like, well, this is how I do it. I do it differently. And it was really eye-opening to see such a diversity of students that are like, you know, early stage in their career, just trying to ramp up and become a reverser, or people who were experienced reversers and wanted to, to come to the class to see if they could get anything new. And, uh, you know, I did 10 years in a row in the desert, and it's, you know, you got to commit yourself to it, because 120 degrees in Vegas every summer, right, for Hacker Summer Camp, a lot of you have been there. And, uh, you know, you're teaching in four days, and it's so much fun, but then everybody else is coming to town and, like, wanting to party, and you're like, ah, leave me alone. Uh, I've, I've been on my feet, and, you know, but I think the, the experience of seeing that diversity of students as professionals was different than the, the BrewCon experience. And then there was another education experience I had where I trained FBI cyber agents for, for years, going to Quantico, Virginia, which is like middle of nowhere, there's nothing there. Uh, you can't even, you like, even just getting lunch is like a difficult thing there. And uh, it's, the FBI Academy is an is a interesting place. Uh, this was at a time when they were, the FBI cyber was just coming to be, and they were just taking, you know, pl essentially the, the FBI agents that were kicking down doors of like drug dealers and they're like, you're a cyber agent now, go. And, and it meant that like I'm walking in and I'm teaching, all right, this is assembly code, we're gonna get do reverse engineering. And they're like, what? I'm like, all right, well, like we're gonna get into, you know, Windows and like you look at the internals and figure out how this thing operate. And they're like, what? All right, like, all right, now we're just gonna learn program, computer programming. And they go, what? And so it's like there were, the amount that we had to build up was like, let's just tear apart the whole class. And often what we had to do was separate of like, who has computer skills, who has absolutely zero skills. And they would start to get frustrated because, you know, they, the material was like moving, you know, it was, it was not something they had the base to be successful in. And then to top it off, they had guns. <laughs> so, so like they're getting frustrated. They have guns. I, I was never in a classroom teaching someone who's 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 got a got a weapon on them, uh, and so it was a really interesting situation. And then they're also next door, they're training the forensic psychologists who are like tracking serial killers, and pop into that classroom. That was a yeah, definitely not the same as uh, reverse engineering at all. So again, a completely diverse learning experience of like the students. And then I started teaching at the university level. The, the university is, is very interesting because it's, they're fresh. They're teenagers very, most often. It's this new generation. You know, uh, they're not the experienced professionals like the black hat crowd. Uh, and I always ask the class in the beginning, you know, who knows, they, none of them know anything about Microsoft Windows when the class starts. Nobody knows anything about, like maybe they had a little bit of assembly code but certainly no x86, and we're really driving into like these deep areas, and they're like, this is like opening a new world to them, because they were just computer science majors, and maybe they heard about the class, and it's like, it's an amazing experience to just see their, their eyes light up of an entirely new field, and then all of a sudden, they're like doing CTFs and getting involved in that world, uh, and the advice you're giving them is, is focused on career or how to be an adult, <laughs> um, which, which actually comes up way more than you would think, you know, teaching at that level. And I think the career advice is also very interesting where I, you know, the younger, younger generation, they're often already have the answer. You just have to like nod your head because they'll be like, well, I have this, you know, job lined up at Amazon and it's going to 
pay me a bunch, but I'm going to live in this random location that I'm going to hate and work on this project that seems not that cool. Or I can go to the government and get you know, all this you know, learn knowledge for free and get free degrees and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, and I'm like, yeah, like, what do you think would be better, learning a breadth of knowledge or being on this super niche thing? And it's sort of like they answer their question for themselves. And then they reach back out years later and was like, that was the best decision ever. And I think it's really rewarding to see as an educator across a long period of time to say, like, they start off of, like, they didn't even know security. And now the students ten, 10 years later are reaching out and they're now a VP of, of security of some bank or they're you know, doing the startup that is like exploding and they're like, wow, that, I, that idea you had w it was amazing. And they're like, it stemmed from learning about malware and trying to you know, fight against evil. And then I was like, I just got that mission in my head and I wanted to start this company. And within years, they're, they're exploding. So that's been interesting. So all these diverse learning experiences come together in my head and it was like, how do you teach at a scale that is much bigger, right? Because I'm talking like maybe the biggest classroom is 100 people, that's, that's as big as you're gonna outreach. You can only do that so many times per year. Like how do, you, how do you go much bigger? And I think that's where the idea for the book came. It was like, all right, we've been teaching at a, at a, at a certain scale, let's make that much wider. Um, and think about like how to reach all those people and and doing this for years, you really learn about how people learn, right? I was telling you, it's like cops with guns who don't know anything about computers to you know, young students to experienced professionals. Everybody learns in a different way, and it comes together. And what ended up becoming a two-year journey where we almost quit five times uh, to actually get this done. And I think that it really made it so when you're teaching people in a classroom, you gain a lot of skills from, you know, and I tell this to, the, to people who are new in career, get in a classroom, teach, it's gonna make you not only understand the material better, but the questions you get are gonna make it so that you know it more thoroughly than you've, you can ever imagine. Uh, and I think that it was worth the effort, even though it was like, you know, two years and a lot of recompiling, we shipped like, 50 different binaries with it. And a lot of times it's like, you wanna make it very explainable and digestible. But what you ended up doing is like, you know, you write some, some code and normally you're writing, if, and you gotta write malware, so you're writing malware, you're compiling it, and then you're reversing it. And you're like, wow, what did the compiler do? And so you're like messing with all these settings just to make it like perfect so that it makes it explainable to the person who's reading it and ending up reversing it. And so there's a lot of iterations of trying to find the right compiler for that and the right settings to make it so that what ended up uh, compiling and, you, and the student would reverse engineer was like actually reinforcing the lesson versus taking them on some tangent. Because uh, that, that comes up a lot in reverse engineering where the compiler puts some code in there and you know, it's not actually part of what the attacker wrote, um, but somebody ends up reverse engineering it. And like, you know, you don't want to reverse engineer like a printf function, that's like not a good time. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the, there ended up being a naked alien on the cover, um, which I think was, in, I, I didn't really love it when we first produced it, but then the fact that like, it's kind of, you know, forget it was nice, because then people just go, oh, the naked alien. On the cover. There actually is like a gory version where it's the aliens open on the table and there's like assembly code pouring out of it. But it was like, it was too, it was too much, so we, we took it away. Now, when you're educating in cybersecurity, at sort of any level, you start to think to yourself, well, there's, there's the good guys and the bad guys, right? There's offense and defense. And you start to think to yourself of, and my father mentioned this to me. He was the first person who said it, and I've heard it a lot. You're putting this information out there. Like, aren't the attackers going to learn from this? And I was like, yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought of that before. But, you know, and then, and then I fast forward years later, and you look at the translations. <laughs> Chinese, Korean, Russian. That's not Russian, though. That's Polish, actually. <laughs> But, but I could, uh, there is a Russian version. Um, and then the fourth one, fourth one is an uh, unsanctioned Farsi edition sold exclusively in Iran, 
which I had smuggled out of the country, and that's the copy I actually have. These, these pictures were taken this last week. <laughs> and when I start to think about that, those are like the, 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 the four biggest translations that are out there. And I think about my day job, right? Tracking nation state threats. Those are the, those are the native languages for the four biggest nation states that we track. And then you start to think to yourself, well, my dad was right. Like, there's probably plenty of attackers that I'm actually tracking, benefiting from reading it. Um, and, you know, you start to get a little torn in that of like, but I, I think to myself of you're rising the tide of all the defenders, I think substantially more than you're helping the attackers. Now, they most certainly learned about it, certainly learned how to circumvent the tools we talked about. Uh, circum a lot more anti-reverse engineering techniques came out since it, probably because they had access to it. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot more people hacking for good than hacking for bad in the world. And so I think the, the rising tide of that will equal out. And I start to think about how that connects into other things I've seen, uh, specifically when I think about commercially available malware. You know, red, red teaming tools, commercially available malware, whatever you want to call it as a polite way. And I think of things like Cobalt Strike, uh, Brute Rattle, and other ones that are out there, where it's red teamers you know, mostly getting access to it and using it on their engagements, and that's what it's meant for. But it's very obviously getting into the hands of a lot of attackers. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the first, time, first big times was, you know, the SolarWinds hack, right? Well, that was a, a big case that, you know, when I was at Mandy and FireEye, we got hacked uh, and ended up figuring out and reverse engineering, really, the commercial software of SolarWinds, realizing they were shipping those update packages. But what was the first thing that was done when they used that fancy supply chain backdoor to get into somebody's network was they would pivot to commercially available malware, Cobalt Strike. That was the number one thing that they did. So why would they do that? They would do that because they want to blend in and have you not find that fancy supply chain backdoor that is in giving them access to everybody's network around the world. right? So then instead, they are pivoting to a piece of malware that a lot of people are using for red teams and whatnot. It might have been showing up in their alerts all the time. And one of the things that we see is uh, doing incident responses uh, on that attack after it was unfolding. A lot of the incident response was you went in and you went into their security logs and you say, look, you caught the whole attack chain right here. You just didn't either didn't look at the alerts or you threw them away because you didn't think it was important enough. But it was all there. There wasn't like this big forensic incident response journey like there normally is when we come in and do an investigation. Uh, and then I started to say, well, how widespread is this? Uh, and I started looking at it in my, in my new role, Unit 42, doing incident response there. We do about 1,000 incident responses a year that we respond to. And started taking statistics of like what is actually happening in those attacks. And 10% of the time when we're responding, uh, it's a commercially available malware that, that is used in the attack. Um, and so we see threat, threat actors, China, Russia, very common uh, for them to pivot to start using those tools to start to, start, start to blend into the landscape. And uh, when you see 10%, you're like, that, that's a pretty, pretty large number. Uh, and I think like, that, to me, is like, where do you draw the line? Is like putting out a malware book that attackers might read and benefit from? putting out malware that attackers might benefit from. I don't know, I start to think that maybe, like, where do, you, where do you draw the line of, like, what's the greater good for the defenders versus the attackers? We're also dealing, I'm also dealing with a situation right now on incident response for a customer where they don't know if it's an actual attacker or a red team. <laughs> so like, we're in there and they're like, yeah, it, we're a week into the investigation. They still haven't figured out if it's an attacker or, or a red teamer. And it, it's Cobalt Strike that's, that's in the network. And they're like, we think it's possible that one of our outside vendors like, went a little too far, um, but they're not sure. And it's like, I'm like, you should know if it's a red team or not. So we're treating it like it's not a red team, obviously, uh, and trying to figure that out. And uh, I've, I've uh, talked about this sort of conflict of like, should these tools be out there or not? I don't know that I have a really strong opinion one way or the other of like the release of cyber weapons to the world. But I, I think 
you know, when I was talking about it once, the lead developer from Cobalt Strike came. He gave me a sticker that's on my laptop. Um, and we actually had a great discussion of like, and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a developer for Cobalt Strike. And, you know, I lead this part of the development team. And, and I think about these things all the time. And so I thought it was just really interesting to think about as an educator when you're in this world, right, where these things can be used for both good and bad. Uh, and so it kind of puts that dynamic in your head of like, you know, thinking through things. Um, another, you know, I, sort of shifting from, you know, at scale, uh, put the book, all that, and I start to think about the Flare teams. Flare team was a team that was established. It started off uh, in the early days of Mandian doing instant response, and it was um, really the first malware team to support incident response operations uh, at, at some sort of scale. And started with just a couple of uh, two of us reverse engineers and sort of grew more and the name Flare FL was, came from FireEye Labs, which became a thing uh, when, when the companies were merged together, Mandian and, and FireEye. And uh, the, the, the part of this is, I think, tied very much to education. And, and something I hope you, you might resonate with you and something you might be able to think about for, for your teams when you, when you go back to work, of we really surrounded the team culture with education. Like it was embedded in everything we did, and I think it created a team culture that was just awesome to be a part of. And uh, a few parts of that is teaching. So we taught internal malware classes, external, reversing classes, other classes. And everybody had to teach. So even somebody who was like, I'm not a teacher, I, I just want to be in, in Ida Pro, reversing all day long, that's my life, I don't want to talk to other people. <laughs> uh, and instead it was like, okay, well you don't have to be like the lead instructor, but you could be a co-instructor and help students in the classroom. And we, f we sort of forced people into that, um, not knowing how that was gonna go, but it ended up that it was really helpful. People like ended up learning how to communicate better with each other because of it, people, um, who did it, who were like, I would never be a teacher, ended up becoming lead instructors and just wanting to teach more than even reverse, and it sort of changed their whole outlook on things. And I think uh, that was a big part of it. The other is, a men we had a, the mentoring, a mentoring program, where no matter who you were, if you joined the team, you had to go through the mentoring program. You could be somebody straight out of college, and you'd get mentored up, or you could be you know, the best reverser in the world joining with 20 years experience, you still had to go through that mentoring program. You made it through the mentoring program a lot faster if you were very experienced, of course, but it was sort of like everybody had been through it and like earned their stripes and had to, be, had to learn and get, and had a mentor assigned to them. And so it was like sort of everybody had been through it and knew that it was like a requirement that you were educated in that way. And it also built this trust of like, you know what the ropes are, you know what the rules are, and it sort of, yeah, it was, maybe it was a little bit of a, like everybody, getting everybody on the same page and learning in the same, same you know, focused way. And so between that teaching and that mentoring, I think it created this culture that ended up creating other things. Like we got into, oh, let's build a CTF. We could educate, we could start educating the world uh, with this. And so I started putting out the, ch the, ch the, the flare on challenge was what it's called and it's still going to this day. I think it's like 12 or 13 years into it and you get these puzzles, you reverse engineer it, but there was also a learning component to it for the people who would want to write it. And internally on the team, you had to submit your like, proposal for what your, your CTF challenge would be. And I think it's everything from like, reverse engineering N Nintendo games to, to more you know, you know, firmware kind of stuff, and all, it's all, all everywhere in between. But one of the big components of it was you had to do a write-up. And the write-up had to expl explain to the reader step-by-step step exactly how to do what you wrote. And again, that was forcing their hand to become educators in a way. Um, and, it, and by doing that, I think it just drove up the collective knowledge of the team. It drove up the collective knowledge of really the, the impact to, to reverse engineering. It made it said, we made a tool for ourselves. How do we get that tool in the open source and share it with everyone? and educate everybody on how to use, you know, the, like, the VM, right, to, for, for Windows, to, like, be able to get uh, an environment set up. Nobody had built that before. We already had it in-house. 
And then it was like, how do we open source this? How do we put out tools like, I think last year some of the members were talking about Kappa, and like that was an open source tool. It created this culture of like everybody wanted to get information out to as many people as possible, including internal and external, and it just got everybody on the same page. And I think it also made it so, I think teams can easily become siloed from even within the team itself, where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm analyzing that, you can't look at my work, because I want to be the one to like get to it first. But instead, the culture was, I'm, I'm analyzing, if anybody wants to join, let's do it. Uh, I know, you know, maybe I know .NET reversing better than you, and how to, but jump in, and you can get the same skills that we have. And so that, that angle just made all the silos removed. And uh, one of the big things as a reverse engineer, you don't want to reverse engineer something that somebody else has already done. That's like a, a thing you, you hate as a reverse engineer, because it's like you're redoing the thing that they did, especially if it's something new, new attack, new malware, whatever it is. And so silos are the worst when it comes to that, right? Because you can analyze something and realize somebody already did it like a week ago, and it's like, why did I duplicate that effort? Like, I hate duplication of effort, and I think that type of culture removes that, that from it. So I think that's something I try to bring to the table every, everywhere that I go. Uh, and so it's one of those things where, you know, it came in uh, to a new role recently after, after 15 years at one job, came in, and it was like, well, how do I... How do I how do I shift the culture to be that? And you never can replicate everything perfectly, but I want that like that thirst for knowledge and sharing to occur. And so started to build sort of similar things. And now instead of this type of CTF, it was like a uh, prompt engineering uh, LLM hacking competition internally that, that the team put together. Uh, and it was like there was explanations, there were guides, there were there were meetings to explain how to do it, and it drove up how how to learn how to do you know, prompt engineer you know, and hack it, hack it to be able to give information that it might not otherwise give. Uh, and so like, trying to bring those aspects in is something I always try and think about and bring to the table. Something that was newer for me from an experience standpoint was uh, joining the Cyber Threat Alliance. Uh, and this is part of like, uh, the Cyber Threat Alliance is a group of cybersecurity companies uh, it's a nonprofit organization, and the goal of it is to share with one another, uh, which is awesome, I think, because one of the big things, especially early on in cybersecurity, was every security vendor was out for themselves and very much like, all right, we're, we're going to be the first to have this blog about this attack, and, and that's going to get us all the clicks and all the notoriety, and that's going to make us the best cybersecurity company, and everybody else who didn't find this like, they're going to have to scramble when this comes out. The cool thing about the Cyber Threat Alliance was, how do we share with each other to create a collective good, right? Because, you know, I'm a Palo Alto Networks, like, yeah, a lot of people have that firewall, but there's a lot of people who don't, right? And they have a checkpoint or a, or a Fortinet or whatever it might be. And if the detection is just in one, it's not protecting everybody, right? And so the Cyber Threat Alliance is, how do we share so that when that detection goes out, it's really, you're kind of like, putting a detection in your product, but then it's putting it in, in everybody's, which is I, like super powerful, right? Because if we were all on the same page with all the same detections, it wouldn't be possible to circumvent one technology and not the other. And that would be a f much more for the, for the greater good. So the mission is pretty awesome. Um, one of the things that happened when I first you know, joined the organization was it was this raw indicator sharing of like, here's hashes and like just IOCs flying around, um, right? So hashes and maybe there was some malware going back, actual binaries, but it'd be like domains and just kind of flowing and it'd be like this really high scale uh, amount of data. And we were getting it at Palo, at Palo Alto Networks and I was like, oh, you know, I, I, and I'm the new guy. So I'm like, is this data even valuable? Uh, and so I started sifting through it, and it turns out that most of it actually was not that valuable because we already had a lot of it. We already had a lot of those things that were inside there. And so I was like, well, why are we, why are we sharing these giant amounts of IOCs if it's not moving the needle? And what we ended up starting to focus on was getting to know that somebody's going to put something out or they have a zero day in their product or whatever it might be, and knowing about that in advance is so powerful and much more powerful than just a bunch of IOCs flowing around. And so at, by creating a work group that was focused more on educating each other 
about what was coming and why it's important to worry about, it actually has moved the needle so much more. Because what can happen is, if I know that a competitor is about to publish on something, a zero day, whatever it is, I can get everything in line before they publish. Right? I could get detections in my products. I could get a story to tell my executives, a story to tell my customers that like I'm ready. Because it's, it's really brutal out there as a cybersecurity professional when somebody drops a blog and, or, or research and, and your customers are like, am I protected to this? And you're like, I don't even know what it is. Right? <laughs> like it's, it's horrible. And you're scrambling. And you all, a lot of you know that scramble. If something gets published and you are, and it's, you know, late night on a Friday most often. <laughs> and that's like, right, that's when every hack drops, right, or big zero day. And then you're scrambling on a Friday night. Imagine if you knew about that on Monday, right? Like how much of a game changer that is. And that's what we've actually adopted here. And, it, and, and then, furthermore, we've started to actually start holding each other accountable on more, like, ethics kind of things as well of like, hey, we just, I just, we just had a zero day in our product and it happens to everybody. And let's not just crap on each other inside our blogs of like, buy my products, I don't have zero days because your day is going to come at some point. And so we actually hold each other accountable to that if we see our sales team or whatever start being like, yeah, their product you know, is no good because they have zero days. We are the ones to then work and stop it. And so, and, and there's, a, there's a rule of the group of like, reach out and just say, call it out and we will put an end to it at our companies. And everybody's on the same page about that. And I think that, that it's interesting to see because we also try to hold people who are not members accountable to that as well. And, uh, and we come to the aid of each other's, even though they're competitors, which is really cool. Uh, for example, uh, one example was like, Microsoft put out all this research. Microsoft is not in, in the Cyber Threat Alliance. Not trying to pick on them, just trying to tell a story of, like, uh, of, of what happened. They put out all this research on, Vol I think it was Volt Typhoon. Um, and you know, it was just in their blog, it was just like, oh yeah, they, they leveraged a, a zero day in, in Fortinet, you know? And just like drop that in a sentence with no, um, no additional information that went to Fortinet. And so what ended up the Cyber Threat Alliance came to the aid of saying, hey, like, when well, you're gonna need more information on that, <laughs> like, that's a big deal if you're just saying that in a sentence with no details given to the organization, no ability to patch, no knowledge of what actually is happening. And like, it was really cool to see the, uh, like a whole collective like, come to the aid of really what was a competitor. Um, and I think that that in and of itself uh, what this organization is doing is just making it better at, at really fighting against you know, evil in a way, right? And so I think that is a totally new form of education to my world, right? Um, there may be some malware aspects to it because there, there's indicators flowing around. But in general, this change of like, let's focus on educating each other versus focus on just throwing indicators all over the place was a turn that I, I'm now starting to think about in, from a threat intelligence standpoint as well. Right? Because I think what, what ends up happening when you, when you start thinking of the threat intelligence world, which is what I, what I work in, is a lot of, a lot of people are like, yeah, like I, I need more, I need information. I need to know what to do today. Like, I'm so overwhelmed. You're just giving me another thousand hashes that are bad. That doesn't really help me um, as, as a defender. And so trying to bring that in and, and think about that as something I, I've done a lot. And then I sort of think this, this came together for me of like, I always thought it was more of like a, like a computer guy and just like I was going to just, you know, I wanted to be a video game programmer and then I heard about reverse engineering and I, I wanted to be a reverse engineer uh, and really focus on that. And, and I was like, you know, it's never, never one for like trying to, you know, think about politics or policy or anything like that. But through this, all this education that, I, that I've uh, done over the years, I think it found it like, all of a sudden now I'm finding myself educating a lot more of like, wow, working these different incidents, right? Where, you know, a you know, Bangladesh bank hack or, you know, SolarWinds hack or in the early days, APT1, where, you know, the uh, China nation state is hacking, you know, com all companies at a huge scale. 
you start to realize how that ties in to a lot of the policies that are starting to happen, particularly in the US government, with like executive orders focused on cybersecurity and actually finally getting our act together when it comes to like the establishment of, of our CISA inside of uh, Homeland Security, which you know, all of that just didn't exist before a lot of these things started to come to light. Uh, and then in this past year, I found myself more engaging with like people who are like more on the policy side, wherever it is. Recently, I, I got to speak with the uh, former ambassador of Ukraine uh, for the US and to hear her experience, which you know, has no cyber uh, knowledge uh, or depth, was like her version of not pet you versus my version of not pet you, if you all remember that hack, right, which is like huge disruption, right? Um, and, you know, some of your, your, your companies just completely were offline for, for a long period of time because of that. And just her view of that as like a destructive thing for Ukraine as the ambassador that was there from Russia versus like my view, which was like, you know, doing instant response across all these different customers who were dealing with this, you know, ransomware. It was just kind of like an interesting situation to see like, and she was educating me on like a total, opening my mind for like a whole new worldview of like how hacks appear to somebody like her as a politician uh, of sorts. And so, you know, it started to pull me into this world of policy and, and thinking through like, what should the rules be to like force a lot of the things I just spoke to you, to you about of like getting people on the same page, driving education and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, I got the chance to testify before Congress uh, the, the, at the House Homeland uh, Security Committee, uh, and it was focused on like what's going to happen with AI from a security perspective. Uh, and there was, there was four of us. One, one guy was like robots, <laughs> focused on, on autonomous robots. And nobody, none of the Congress people asked him about the Terminator. Like, how do you not ask about the Terminator? Um, and, and if you, you know some of the more notorious Congress people uh, in the United States. I did not get any questions about space lasers, which I really thought was, I was hoping for, because I think it would make a really good story. And it's, and it's a weird situation to be involved in where, you know, if you wanna, it's three hour, it was three hours sweating in the lights, not knowing if I should drink more water because it might be another hour, who knows. And uh, meanwhile, they could come in, ask a question for five minutes, and walk out. And they're just doing that. And furthermore, some actually wanted to move the needle. Uh, turn, you know, cybersecurity is pretty bipartisan, which is a good thing if you're testifying. Um, and I think that it's, it's one of these things where there were actually good questions about moving the needle because they, the, they asked a lot about education and cybersecurity. Uh, and I think. That was good. The thing that was not, and so that education of them in that way, which is now gonna have a follow-on, more private thing to, to educate them more, was good. The part that was not fun was the part, the politi more political stuff that they would get and they'd like trail every question with like, yeah, so you said uh, hacking is increasing because of AI, and that's also because of President Biden, right? <laughs> you know, and, and then you're like on the spot, and you're, uh, another was uh, the border and immigration, and they're like, so you're talking about security co-pilots, um, you know, how are you going to use that to secure the, the border better than, you know, the politician sitting next to me, and just like stares them down. Um, and so, so that was <laughs> trying to educate them on like the fact that I'm not a border control expert was, um, was a, an interesting experience, but I think the point is, is that through education, like just reversing malware wouldn't have taken me to a spot like that. I think that that was, was a really uh, unique experience to, to, to live through. So how I'm going to wrap up here is I think taking what you can be as an educator doesn't have to be testifying for Congress and writing books. I think that you can, you can do that and you can get there. But I think it's starting small, and it's starting focusing on your team, your team dynamics, and really trying to remove silos that, that come up. When I talk to a lot of cybersecurity professionals, that's what the, one of the biggest things they complain about in their job, if, if they're upset with their job, is the silos that are, that are created when they're trying to do analysis and, or move the needle, or work at a customer, or whatever it might be. And I think 
education could be that thing uh, that, that can, can unite it. I think that, you know, I attribute a lot to it, but I think also it's a way to, to grow yourself. I think I, tr I attribute also, like, ability to talk to, like, an executive or a CISO. I was at NATO yesterday, and like be able to do that kind of thing, I attribute 100% to being an educator. I don't think I could do that before I obtain those types of skills. And so I really try and focus on like everyone can have an impact, and it doesn't have to have to start big. Start small. You know something for sure that somebody else doesn't. Show up, come to BrewCon, and teach a workshop on that topic. Right? Come, go to your internal team and say, I'm going to start doing a monthly series on educating the group on malware, because I know a lot about malware. And so we'll do a new piece of malware every month. Those are the things you can do that's going to actually bring a unity to the team. And then you can go from there, right? And see how far it can take you. Um, so with that, uh, I think it's, it's time now. I want to turn it over to, to Q&A. Ask me anything. And I think the other room has a mic too, right? Yeah, indeed. Uh, if someone from other room has questions, you can also have a mic just in front. But here in the room, some questions? It could be any incident response, malware, life, beer, <laughs> whatever it might be. No questions? Oh. Yep. You got a mic? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when you started the reversing, uh, reverse engineering, how long did it took you to um, yeah, get at some uh, level that you could contribute? How, how long does it take? It, it, I, um, I've started, uh, um, no, no, I started, I, um, I tried to go into the field of reverse engineering, sometimes with the CTF, but it's very hard, uh, and it, it, the, the learning curve is a very uh, steep. Uh, so how long did it take you to yeah, get into that field? Yeah, I think it depends. Like, number one, it depends like, what you want to reverse engineer and what your goals are, so that, that's part of it. Um, I think it's also about building a strong base. So if you want to be a successful reverse engineer, you can't just be like, I'm just going to take this file, disassemble, and just start pouring through assembly code. It's all going to just, it's going to be like, it's going to look like the matrix, right? <laughs> like, where it's like, just coming down doesn't make any sense. And I think what you need to do is, um, there's a few things to become good at reverse engineering. The first is building that base of like, becoming a strong, more lower language programmer, like a C programmer, not a Python programmer, because you start to learn about things like memory and pointer manipulation and stuff like that and when you program in C. So a lot of times I tell people, like, go write some programs in C with that and deal with pointers and structures and all that kind of stuff. That's going to build the base. And then it's all about, with reverse engineering, is you have to do it a lot. You, um, it's one of those things where, because it's, it's like the matrix in a way, where the more you reverse engineer, the better you get at reverse engineering. And I think a big thing you need to do is find, like, walkthroughs, like things that actually explain to you when you get stuck, step by step how to do it. Because what ends up happening as a reverse engineer is you go down these rabbit holes. I mentioned earlier, like, you don't want to reverse engineer a print function, right? Because it's just put there uh, by the compiler, but you don't, you don't want to actually reverse that. So like realizing when you're going down a rabbit hole is really important. So I think like trying to find, you know, uh, information that, that can ramp you up on that and step-by-step and step show you how to analyze it. And a lot of CTFs do that post-mortem, like how to find it. Um, but for me personally, uh, I, don't, I don't know, like months or something to start doing it, but to get proficient at it took a really long time where you could just pull things up. And just by looking at the, sh the, the graph without even looking at the assembly code, you sh can start to see higher level languages and, move, and, and say higher, li higher level code constructs and make sense of it much faster. And, and really pinpoint on what you actually need to reverse engineer. And I think a lot of people get stuck where they try and reverse engineer from like line one of the program and make sense of it. 
And that's absolutely not the way to reverse engineer. You should always be looking for shortcuts. Like, all right, the malware goes to this domain, find that domain in the malware and start reversing at that spot because that's deep in the spot where the actual relevant information is. Um, and then I think you know classes, workshops, all that kind of stuff will drive it faster. But I think you, if you don't have the base, it gets really hard hard to make progress. Um, and I started reversing like not malware. I didn't actually reverse malware until I I was more CTFs and firmware stuff. And then I was I, I got into malware once I started doing incident response. And it was like, oh, you know how to reverse? Here's a piece of malware. And that's like how I got into malware analysis. Um, okay. There's another question right behind. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think is the best way to motivate politicians to get educated in cyber? I think it took major cyber events to motivate politicians, right, where people's lives get impacted. There was not a single executive order out in the United States until the oil pipeline hack. And people don't have their gas, all of a sudden there's executive orders, right? I think, I think it's gonna take maybe even bigger attacks to, unfortunately, to, to motivate people uh, more. I think that there also hasn't been, there has been, but not to the scale, I think. I mean, I even think about the, the, the whole, you know, Russia, Ukraine, of like, a lot of us in cyber thought it, there was gonna be much more cyber devastation uh, going down than what actually happened. And I think that maybe it's gonna take something like that to, to really cause that motivation where I don't think the average person's life has been impacted enough to make them move the, the you know make their voter uh, relevant to the voters uh, i think that you know yeah maybe their identity got stolen or their you know they couldn't pay their water bill on time but it wasn't enough of an impact that it's going to like move the needle there so i think it's that's going to take it but i also see that there is a there are ratcheting up they're realizing that this is where things are going and like when I started in this, there was no homeland security. There, there was no homeland security. There was no cyber division of it. The militaries didn't have cyber divisions, which they do now. I told you about the cyber agents, right? It was the 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 people who were busting drug dealers just all of a sudden were cyber agents. But now they have a whole program, and the quality of of the cyber agents has gone up uh, drastically from from a skill set perspective. So, I think it's m moving along. Um, not as fast as I would like. I think there's still no doctrine of like, is a cyber attack the same as a, you know, real attack? Like, if you blow up an oil pipeline, is it any different than hacking it and disabling it for a long period of time? Probably not. When, as long as there's no, you know, casual, casualties when you blow it up, I think it's very similar impact, right? People might not have heat, and then they're going to get hurt by that. So, I think it's going to take something like that, but who knows? <laughs> I, oh, yeah, it works. Um, so I think a big part of your talk was actually about education. Um, and one of the big challenges that we see always in education is that we are in a fast-moving environment that always change, and especially in cybersecurity, right? Like the scene that we are working with right now is not the one that we worked with five years ago. And you've also mentioned this about your book, that the techniques um, you were using where it took you five years to write it and then the question is how relevant how much of it was actually relevant how much became obsolete and then i wonder about your thoughts about how can we actually overcome this challenge that we see always in education how can we actually keep bringing the most recent image and the most recent uh, knowledge to the crowds that's a great question uh and i i, th I think of it as the following i think of it as Education can be like, it's sort of like riding a bike, right? Like once you learn to ride a, a bike, doesn't any bike, right? Somebody comes with a, a different style bike or a new bike with new gears and new wheels. It, it might be way more advanced than the previous bike, but you still know how to ride a bike, right? At, at the end of the day. And I think that's, you know, for example, we, we, you, t you mentioned the book. I think like it, it's well over 10 years old but it's still relevant to people and still teaching that. Is it going to actually be relevant to the current day malware? No, but in the book, you learn how to 
ride the bike. And then if there's a new one, you need to have the skills to know how to like, okay, well, there's new wheels, they're skinnier, I need to balance a little more. Instead of worried about like, I'm gonna fall and, and break my knee, <laughs> you know, like instead you're focused on, oh, this is a little bit different balance or I have to shift in a different way or whatever it is, and that is more your focus. So I think it's, it's a situation like that. I do think that there's a thought that things are moving so fast, but they actually don't move as fast as people think. I think there is new things that are coming out all the time. I mean, look at cloud. I mean, and now we have like a cloud incident response capability, right? And engineers focused on all the major clouds and they're, they're, they're doing that. Like, there's an evolution, of course, but at the end of the day, it's all about that base building. And I think if you build the base, learning something that's a little bit, there's a new reverse engineer. There's always gonna be a new reverse engineering take. There's always gonna be an attacker who figures out a way to, finds a new zero day. You don't have to get educated on that zero day because it doesn't exist yet, but you should probably learn about all the previous ones so you know the nuance of it. And so that's the way I think about education is like, I actually don't think it's that important to have always the current state of the art. Um, and uh, I do think over a period of time it happens though. And so like when I teach at the university, I found myself like, okay, like I, I need to refresh this. Like this, this hack is just too old. It's not relevant. Um, might not even run on the virtual machine anymore. Like it doesn't work. You know, a lot of this stuff was for, for the class. It was in Windows XP and like the way some of the hack, hacking works there with process injection and stuff. It doesn't work the same in Windows 11, right? So like you, you have to evolve, but it, the, the base hasn't changed at all in, you know, as long as I've been doing it, right? So that's the way I, I think about it. Yeah, and yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking as well, that the base doesn't change. And that also brings me to my second question, which, is, which was about the Cyber Threat uh, Alliance. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned that this um, was actually helping companies or uh, different um, uh, threat protection companies uh, to work with each other instead of fighting with each other. But then I haven't also heard much about the actual cooperation on the cyber level instead of just not shaming each other about uh, zero days. So what are they actually doing to make sure because the basic knowledge that you need to detect something is always the same. The basic knowledge that you need to reverse something is always the same. So what kind of efforts is this alliance bringing to the table? To, to share from a analysis standpoint or? or? Yeah, for, for like, as you, like, it's always the same, uh, the same core, right, that we work with from an analysis perspective, from an attacker perspective, right? We, we always look for kind of the same stuff. Uh, so sharing all of this knowledge together is what brings us together further. Um, if you look now at most SIM tools, for example, they are all fighting against each other to build the same deductions for the same zero days, for the same uh, attacks. And instead of working with each other to actually cover all of this base, they are just fighting commercially to see who will get there first. Yeah, no, that is something we've been talking about in the Cyber Threat Alliance, so giving each other early access has been a big movement from just sharing around IOCs, like I said, um, and, and actually giving each other, hey, this, I'm gonna be publishing this research next week. You, need, you all need to know about it because it's gonna be big news and you're gonna wanna get prepared. So that was like our first step. We have a longer, longer term goals to start doing some of the things you're saying where it's not just, oh, um, we're gonna drop a zero day, like you should know, it's, we did analysis on something that's new. How do we share or even come together on like analyzing something together at, at the same time? And so we're started to build some, um, we have like a work group on, on AI, adversarial AI. And so we're trying to sort of share with each other as we're seeing things and as we're learning things. Um, and so like that's one of the, the, the groups that we're doing and it's, it's all competitors sharing information. Um, but it's one of those things where there's, I mean, yeah, we have NDAs in place and all that kind of stuff, but you're, fight, you're, fighting, this, you're fighting the system, right, uh, in a way, because the reason the Cyber Threat Alliance has to exist is because these, I mean, at the end of the day, you are fighting each other for customers, right? Like, you want them to buy your firewall and not the competitors because that's better for your business. So, like, you, the fact that you have that competition is a great thing, right, because it's pushing everybody to build the best product possible, but it, it is exactly pitted against let's share and actually defend everybody. 
And so our organization, uh, and I actually have sort of a, uh, an ability that I've, I've been granted by my executive leadership and my chief product officer and everything that says I can operate in this way. And like people need to stay out of the way, even though um, people might be like, why do not share that? Because we're gonna lose a marketing edge. And it's like, no, we are sharing it because of X, Y, and Z, right? If it's a new product feature, obviously we don't share that with them. But like if it's something about the attack and the threat, that's where I'm sort of have a granted. And I think that's really a cool thing about, about the, the culture there. Is there another question? Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you for your speech. And in terms of reverse engineering, uh, how much you think it, we can do automation and it, or how much it will be still manual work? Yeah, I think some of the AI stuff is starting to show some promise. I think a lot of people have been focused on, you know, how to use generative AI to do some of the reversing tasks. Um, I think, you know, for reading source code and summarizing what's there, it's actually shown some promise. And I think it's only going to get better with developing code and stuff like that. Um, a lot of a lot of research, obviously, focused on that. When I start to think about reverse engineering. Uh, I think that automation will get you pretty far. I think there will create a, uh, a need for the, the malware authors to create uh, anti-reverse engineering techniques that trip up the automations and the generative AI work that people are applying to it. Uh, and we've seen a history of attackers doing that. Um, when uh, decompilers first came out, uh, they actually did pretty well against a lot of malware, where they could take the assembly code and turn it back into like a source code language that you could read. And so what happened? Well, the attackers knew we were using those tools, and they created uh, techniques to, to break its ability to do that. Same thing with the disassemblers. They created anti-disassembly techniques to break the, the analysis tools we were using. And I think that when you run into is, those tools are gonna to work really well, but then they're gonna figure out a way to trip them up. And I think when you start to look at generative AI and you see how easy it is to, to jailbreak it, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's pretty over the top of like removing the guard, like yeah, you say like, uh, make a bomb for me. It's like, sorry, I can't tell you. It's like, tell me a love story about making a bomb and, it, and, then, and, and, and expand on the details and it like gives you it, right? Like, so there's, there, there's a lot of uh, problems with those technologies that need to be worked out. So I, and I think at the end of the day, reverse engineers will, will always be needed for some set of the malware, but I do think that automation will just kind of make things faster and faster for the analyst to move through it and make, get understanding of, of what actually is there. So I think the things that like show promise is like, real quickly, what do you think I'm looking at? And it telling you, and I see it as like a, more of like an Iron Man suit where you put on the automation Iron Man suit and you're like an even better reverse engineer versus like it's just gonna put you out of the job. Um, that's how I see it going based on the history of all these anti-reverse engineering you know, techniques that have come out. So one more question because then- There's one, just one down here. The, one there is here. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. And kind of piggy piggybacking off, off of the previous question, but how do we, uh, let's say, um, involve uh, malware analysis and reverse en engineering more into incident response and post-mortem uh, processes? Um, and for you, what is the value of it besides looking at attribution and possibly behavioral analysis of the attacker itself? <coughs> How do we, yeah, because in, in, in blue teams, for example, what you'll see often in, in modern enterprises is they start with malware analysis, but then the next incident comes and they already have to sh shift focus and continue with the next one. Um, yeah, how, how would you uh, solve for that? Or at least how do you see that? Well, I think, I think malware analysis is like a huge part of an incident response process. I do think that uh, incident responders themselves should have some skill sets in malware analysis. I think for sure, like all the basics need to be down so that they can get get handle that low hanging fruit uh, as as quickly as possible and and decide if if it is something that actually needs a reverse engineer to look at. But then when a reverse engineer gets it, I think it could be a critical part of figuring out the attack. I think in the early days of uh, of incident response. It was a lot easier to do malware analysis from a 
business standpoint, because what would happen is there'd be this huge, like, um, you could bill as many hours as you want, because they're like so in trouble, and it's like, well, we need to reverse engineer all of this malware. But nowadays, there's insurance companies who have showed up. And insurance companies show up, and they say, you've had an incident. We will pay for 50, 100 hours of, of analysis, and that's it. And so what we run into a lot, even as incident responders in Unit 42, is we do a lot of malware analysis that is not paid for by the customer. Whereas in the early Mandiant days for me, all that malware analysis was paid for by the customer. And so we do it for its threat intelligence value now, rather than for the incident response. I think another thing that's happened, to your point about attribution, is it's a lot harder to do attribution off of malware alone. In the early days of incident response, I would go into a network and be like, there were version control numbers in the malware, and you'd be like, this is, you're on version five? Wow, you have good security. The attacker's on version five. Or you go to another customer, and they'd be on version one, and you'd be like, oh, you're, you're bad security here. Like, it's gonna be really bad. And so, and you'd be like, hey, I know it's this attack group in China, and it's their malware. Now, malware reuse is rampant. They're all using each other's malware. And so, attribution off of just malware is like, a thing that's much harder these days. It used to just be the malware could do the attribution. Now you got to worry about, you got to focus on the infrastructure. Are they reusing their infrastructure? Who are they attacking? There's so much more that goes into attribution. And I think attribution is way harder and takes way longer to be correct about it uh, than it did, you know, 15 years ago. So. Thank you. Sure. There is another one. I don't know if we have time. Um. <laughs> will be really quick, uh, <laughs> and then I suggest if you have more questions to reach yeah, out to yeah. you after Yeah, after I'll, be, the talk. I'll be around too if people want to talk. Who? What? Okay. Thank you for, for the talk. Um, on your experience of malware analysis, uh, uh, comparing to beers, uh, what is the therapist of the, the malware? Um, you, Wait, sorry, what was that? Uh, comparing malwares to, 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 to the beers, eh? what is the, the malware, malware you, you could compare with the Trappist? Hmm? <laughs> the best flavor. <laughs> oh, wow, I, should, I did, did not see that question coming. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, that's a good question, because, like, do you... Do you go with the most advanced? But it's, uh, you know, I think of it as more of like, it's been there for a long time. They don't change their recipes and introduce new things. And, it, and, it, and it's so good and you can age it. And it still, still, uh, still hangs in there. So for malware, that gets, it gets much tougher. Uh, so you gotta go to like some sort of long running malware, I feel like. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know, maybe a root kit or something. Cause you don't see those as much as you used to, so. Maybe that's what I'll, I'll go with, one of the, one of the big root kits. So, yeah. Awesome. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you.